We have a fascinating guest and topic today, Charles Delheim, professor of history at Boston University. Professor Delheim joined Boston University in 2001 after a fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania's Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. He was trained in modern European cultural history and his chief publications in modern British history include The Face of the Past, The Preservation of the Medieval Inheritance in Victorian England, and The Disenchanted Isle, Mrs. Thatcher's Capitalist Revolution. The son of a German Jewish refugee, Charles Delheim was born in New York City. In recent years, his work has focused on the role of Jews in modern culture. His new book, published by the Brandeis University Press, is Belonging and Betrayal, How Jews Made the Art World Modern. Professor Charles Delheim, welcome to the Next Steps Forward. Thank you, Chris. Very nice to be with you. And before we start, I have to ask, because my listeners know I'm an avid sports fan. You live in Boston, but you're born in New York. Yankees. Yank a boy. You can stay on the show. I passed the first test. I, in fact, I um, one of the, the one essay that I probably most enjoyed writing was an essay published in, I guess, 2004 or five called A Yankee Fan in Red Sox Nation, uh, for which I took a great deal of flack. <laughs> <laughs> I can, especially at that time. Uh, yeah, I totally understand that. I appreciate your bravery for that. <laughs> so mentioning New York City, would you share your life story with our audience? Uh, when I mentioned to my wife last night that you were going to ask me about my life story, uh, she said, oh, well, that you can talk about. The question is how much time they have. <laughs> uh, so I like to tell my students that I was a Brooklyn boy before Brooklyn was cool. Uh, this is not the Brooklyn of hipsters and um, baby carriages and flannel shirts. I was born into a, a kind of aspiring world. Um, I grew up for my first 12 years of my life right across from Prospect Park um, in on Ocean Parkway, which is one of the longest roads in Brooklyn and leads ultimately to Coney Island and to, I guess, where um, the fun was or a certain kind of fun was. And I was a very shy, bookish boy um, with, I guess, one little theatrical um, streak. In fourth grade, I was, to the surprise of everyone, the star of the school play. Uh, that was to my surprise, too, actually, <laughs> for somebody who couldn't really even talk in class easily. And I was interested in reading and in um, baseball. I grew up. Um, um, in an environment in which learning was certainly valued and being smart was important. Um, I was near my aunt, my aunt and my grandmother, as well as my parents. So being a good boy um, was also important. And I think I did that pretty well. I uh, never really had a, um, a breakout in that regard. I went to New York City public schools all the way. And um, I um, uh, benefited from that greatly. I think in large part because when I was in fourth grade, our school was integrated for the first time. So um, the kids that I grew up with came from very, very different backgrounds. And that's something that has stayed with me long before anybody ever talked about diversity. And my family made the great migration from Brooklyn when I was just before I was 13 to Little Neck and then ultimately to Great Neck. Um, these are places that appear in F. Scott Fitzgerald's um, The Great Gatsby, though I can say that um, my time in Little Neck bore no resemblance to the great parties of The Great Gatsby. <laughs> um, it wasn't really that interesting. I was a, I read a lot. Um, I was very interested in politics. One of the peculiarities of growing up in the New York City school system when I did was that when I was in fourth grade, um, our class received a free subscription to the New York Times. And one of the first things I learned was how to fold the paper so you could read it on the subway. Um, I don't think anyone, well, no one had any idea that people would be either not reading it or reading it on their tablets or on their phones. Um, I was a very good student until um, middle of junior high school, and then I 
just tanked. I lost interest. And in school, though not in reading and learning, I always loved reading history and literature, and as I said, politics. Um, but I was a, a very indifferent student. I was good at some things, and um, which I enjoyed, and the things that I um, wasn't naturally good at or naturally interested in, um, I did no work in and I received the results I deserved, which were um, not good. And um, um, college and graduate school, I sort of buckled down and uh, worked hard. I think in my family, uh, the expectation was that I would go to college and I would go to graduate or professional school. And, um, and I followed those expectations, though it wasn't something that I did consciously to please my parents, though. Looking back on it, um, pleasing my parents, who I loved very deeply, was um, important to me. How did your father's experiences as a German Jewish refugee shape your life as you grew up, and did they influence your academic interests? It's a great question, and it's a hard one. My dad, like many refugees, didn't talk much about what happened to him or his family in Germany. I lived in a small town in the Rhineland called Mutterstadt, mother town, uh, though as things turned out, it was not exactly a nurturing mother to them, quite the opposite. And they had lived there for hundreds of years. They were the first Jews in the town. Uh, they built the synagogue. Um, they were merchants, grain dealers, horse dealers. My father liked to say horse thieves, um, cattle dealers, and those kind of agricultural middlemen occupations were typical of Jews, both in the Rhineland and across the border in Alsace, largely because there was so much they couldn't do. So I knew where my father came from. Um, I knew that he had come to this country gratefully um, at age 15 with his sister, um, who was a year older. And I knew that things were tough, that you know he worked two or three jobs and um, kept on going and became a very successful um, uh, businessman. And uh, so hard work was something that was built into me. And I can tell you that when our younger daughter, Caroline, was in middle school, she came home with a B plus in an English paper, which didn't bother me in the least. It was a lot better than I got in my English papers in those days. And she said, what should I do? I said, well, work harder. <laughs> she didn't like that. <laughs> but Germany was not much discussed, but my father um, had close ties with the German company. We had German friends. Um, and I went to a variety of family parties in which the yayas, as my father called them, all had accents and all came from somewhere else. And I think that on a, a conscious level, but really on a subliminal level, I was just fascinated by what was this story? Um, why did they come? What had happened to them? And it was something my dad discussed with great difficulty. So I think that in terms of my father's background, but also my mom's, her family came from uh, the Austro-Hungary, Austro um, from Galicia, and um, she was born in America. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother was born in America and prided herself on being a modern woman, though her definition of what's modern and ours were very, very different, shall we say. Um, and as I said, learning was very important. Education was important. And I think that had enormous impact on me. Um, in terms of historical interests, I doubt that I would have been a historian, though, of course, I don't know. You only have one life. There's no control group out there. Um, if it hadn't been for my family background, the awareness of my family coming from somewhere else, I had my father's uncles um, uh, where it went to Chile because they weren't able to get into America. I had family all over the place. And I think there was a, a certain riddle there that I unconsciously wanted to solve. So I think that had a lot to do with my historical interests. In terms of specific academic interests, um, initially, not so much. As you know, I wrote largely about England in the early part of my career. 
And um, I guess a lot of reasons for that. Um, uh, I was a lover of English literature. That's what I studied um, in college for the most part, though I also studied history. And then there was just the role of accident. I was going to originally write uh, my dissertation, which turned out to be my first book on England, France, and Germany. And my advisor, a very wise man, cautioned me that if I wanted this book to come out while my hair was still the same color, cut it down. And I ended up going to England, falling in love with the place, uh, which was strange in a way because 1976, 1977, the country was in the midst of a political and social crisis. But for my part, I was having the time of my life and um, it was very liberating to be there. You're scaring me here a little bit. I'm in the first year of my doctorate program and haven't started my dissertation yet, but you're saying that yours turned into a book. And so I can't imagine how much writing is involved with that. So I, I may pick your brain a little bit as I go through the process. So that's okay. Yeah, pick, pick it away. Uh, I think like most professors or most like most people of a certain age, um, I don't stint on advice. Whether anybody <laughs> listens to it's another question. I get what I pay for, right? That, yeah, exactly. <laughs> your latest book is titled Belonging and Betrayal. How and why did you choose that title and what's its significance? Well, let me say, first of all, it's not an autobiography. Um, so um, there may be some personal tub stacks, but that's not what I was after. Um, in a way, you know, belonging and betrayal are two fundamental human experiences, um, the one very desirable and the one traumatizing all of our fears. And I think that one of the things we all come away with during the pandemic is um, the need to belong, to connect, to affiliate, um, to have the solace of other people and to have a, a sense of being accepted. Um, for Jews in the 19th and early 20th centuries, this took on added significance because these are people who were um, being emancipated gradually as it happened. They were given political and legal rights um, in some places more than others at different times. Um, but emancipation didn't guarantee respectability. Um, it certainly didn't guarantee social acceptance. And the people that I write about and the people who interest me were people who were departing from Jewish orthodoxy. And yes, they had ties to Jewish communities. Some had ties to Judaism in terms of religious observance, others did not. But their drive in life was to belong and to succeed. Um, to find ways of defining a role for themselves in this larger culture. And that's what belonging was about. Betrayal is the unhappy um, end to this. Um, the social contract behind what we tend to call assimilation or acculturation or um, cultural integration ran something like this. Um, give up your customs, give up your language, um, observe your religion in private, adopt our ways, adopt our language, pledge allegiance to our flag, um, immerse yourself in our traditions, and we will accept you more or less. That was the social contract. And at some times it worked pretty well. And I think it's important not to deny that Jews were um, not just victims of European high culture, and society, they were also actors. But the closer the people that I write about got to the center of the art world um, and this kind of symbolic center of the culture, uh, the more they were regarded as trespassers, as intruders, as people who had no place there. And that for all of the love they had of this European culture, um, what they found instead was a terrible backlash first in the form of anti-Semitic competitors who didn't think that Jews could ever really appreciate art, let alone become part of a national tradition, like say French art. Um, and then by the Nazis who um, stole everything that Jews had, including their lives, and that's the betrayal. And the tension in the book is between these two things. How'd you become interested in the topic of Jews, Jews influence in the art world? 
I, I think that to a large extent, it was an accident. I studied you know, European cultural history um, in graduate school and I taught it for many years. Um, I was interested in Jews, um, not so much in a religious sense, but in a secular sense, in the sense of um, what happens to a minority when they, uh, when members are departing from their own community and trying to integrate into a larger community. And I think that's a, a big issue in our own society for obvious reasons and um, not simply or primarily about Jews. Um, so for a long time, I wrote about Britain, um, everything from um, British politics, you know, um, Thatcher's England to um, studying and working with English businesses like Cadbury Schweppes and Jaguar cars. Um, I got candy from Cadbury's, no car from Jaguar. Um, though I would have liked one, I have to say, and if anyone is still out there, I'm more than happy to accept a latter day gift, which I don't think is forthcoming. But, you know, after a while, um, I simply became tired of it. And um, I'm more of a generalist by, than a specialist by temperament. Um, I'm interested in a lot of different things. So you could say I was a dilettante. I'd prefer not to think of myself that way. But I think that partly um, as a result of getting older, of um, being married, of having a father, uh, being a father and, um, my own parents aging, um, that this whole issue of Jews in modern culture kind of forced itself upon me. It wasn't something that I was consciously after. And what turned the tide was really two things. One, a kind of cultural phenomenon, the other a uh, conversation. And the cultural phenomenon was in the late 1990s, as you know, there was a dramatic resurgence of interest in the fate of Nazi stolen art. So more than five decades um, after these after the war was over, uh, this new awareness that this was a problem to be solved and a story to be told. And I was drawn into the story. And then on a personal level, um, I had a conversation many years ago with a man named Andre Kalman, who was a very dear friend of my wife's family and who I'd known by then for some time, though not well. And um, Andre uh, was a Hungarian refugee who was studying in Paris. And uh, when the war broke out, his entire family was killed. He ended up in England, wanted to be a film director, um, but that wasn't such an easy business to get into. And then um, became involved in art dealing. And um, with a conversation with Andre, um, who was like your proverbial charming Hungarian and also a tremendous tennis player. He played seniors at Wimbledon for years. I learned about many of the, most of the people who are actually the protagonists of my book. And it is not false modesty to say that I knew absolutely nothing about them at the time. Um, but years later, um, as I was looking for a new subject to write about, um, this seemed like the subject. I thought it was going to be a short book um, that I wrote in a short time. Uh, so I was wrong on both counts. As you know, the Nazi plundering of priceless art is not the focus of belonging betrayal. But I'd like to explore the topic briefly, if I may. Why did the cause of the art stolen by the Nazis rise to the level of attention that it finally did in the late 1990s, as you just mentioned? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. I, I think the first factor, which is the most important, is that by the 1990s, the Holocaust or the Shoah had moved from the margins of public consciousness to the center. Um, it was something that was discussed in a variety of memoirs, films, histories, um, in memorials. And that awareness of this tragedy, which was a European tragedy and a Jewish tragedy, though also a tragedy for um, political, for you know, political dissenters, for um, gay people, for Jehovah's Witnesses, um, is suddenly front and center. That's the first thing. 
The second thing was in the middle of the 1990s, there were revelations about what was called Nazi gold, about the corruption of Swiss banks, uh, which were clearing houses for Hitler and in which um, Jews of you know, relatively modest means or those who are really well to do um, would put their money in the hope of providing themselves an insurance policy as the uh, Nazi regime became worse and worse and persecution more and more brutal. And um, after the war, um, these upright Swiss bankers in certain cases just kept the accounts and um, that came out. I think that in other respects, um, the story of Nazi stolen art, this darkly enthralling story of how Nazis and their collaborators ransacked Jewish owned um, art collections, uh, along with much else, sacred books, precious manuscripts, um, musical instruments and so forth, um, appeals to this general interest we have in art theft. I mean, how many movies are there about art thefts or art heists? Uh, but there's no art heist or no art theft um, um, that even approaches what took place in the Nazi era. And as individuals and families began to press their claims, uh, museums were caught red-handed, um, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, um, city where I live now, uh, that what they found was that they were you know, exhibiting uh, and in many cases that they had purchased uh, works of art with a money provenance that had been stolen from Jewish collectors um, during the war and sold either during the war or its aftermath. And at first museums, galleries, auction houses did a, you know, a bloody awful job in not just not vetting this art. And as an art dealer, as Andre Kalman told me, um, the first thing you do is you vet the provenance or the history and they hadn't done it. Uh, and then they began to do it really because of public pressure. I think all of these factors um, came together. You know, the compelling question for you as you become more interested in the topic is that Jews by and large have been outsiders to European civilization and outsiders with a relatively weak visual culture. Could you explain the phrase relatively weak visual culture, please? Sure. Um, it's the long, ambiguous shadow of the second commandment, um, uh, the ban against graven, graven, image, uh, graven images, against worshiping idols. And uh, one of the questions was, well, did this ban uh, prohibit um, not just idol worship, but the creation of um, uh, visual icons of objects? And... Um, you know, I think the best reading of it was the answer was no, um, but it does be, did become a taboo in certain communities when people like um, the great novelist Isaac Basheba Singer was a rabbi's son, uh, grew up in Poland in his father's house, there were no pictures. Now, in fact, the idea that Jews had no visual art um, is a myth. And the same thing for uh, in the Islamic tradition, which produced absolutely magnificent, uh, fine and decorative art. But I think what is true was that Jews were preeminently the people of the book. They were focused on literary texts. That was the source of wisdom and of understanding and of religious practice and debate. And while there are some exceptions to this, frescoes in the old Dura Europis synagogue, um, there were portraits of rabbis in the uh, 18th century, uh, and they certainly were not doing anything to violate Jewish law. Um, the big change comes with the encounter of Jews with European cultural traditions, um, especially in the 19th and 20th centuries as they migrate from Russia and Eastern Europe to the West, um, as they become um, exposed to the great painters and their works of art, which were suffused in many cases with Christian images, with Christian narratives. Professor, before we get back to the book, what keeps you in the classroom? 
And what do you like about teaching? Well, I think I loved teaching from the start, um, in part because I had great teachers who were not only um, really distinguished scholars and writers, but who were personally very kind and generous to me and made a big difference in my life. And, you know, there's no way to repay such people. Um, but I've tried to do in my own modest way for that, for, for my students, what they did for me. And I think that there's nothing like the pleasure of being with young people all the time and helping them on the way, um, steering them um, in some cases in a slightly more constructive direction <laughs> than they're going in. And the challenge now is uh, I'm teaching students with masks, which is necessary, you know, we've got to do it. Um, but between their masks and, their, and my eyes, it's tough. Yeah, I can't imagine what that environment is like. I'm an adjunct professor, and so the last obviously year has been just virtual like this, and so it's a different ball game right now. It sure is. We'll we'll get through it. We'll get through it. We will. So, Professor, your book takes us from Vienna to Pasadena, from the 1860s to the Second World War. I spent about 80 years or so. How long did it take you to research it? And as we mentioned, this era of COVID. Did the process involve travel, digging through archives in different cities or countries, in-person interviews? Well, it's really hard to give you an accurate answer about how long it took me to research it. Um, for almost the entire time that I was working on this book, I was teaching and I was also spent most of my time, you know, as an administrator, um, chairing a department, building and running a college. So uh, a lot of the research was done in the summers here and there. Um, in terms of travel, it involved travel um, all over Europe and the United States, 14 archives um, from Villa Itati in outside of Florence, uh, the beautiful um, um, home of Bernard and Mary Berenson, who are main characters in the book, to um, Pasadena, as you say, to Henry Huntington, um, who uh, also appears in the book because he bought great 18th century English pictures. And you know, it's a book that's based on archives and uh, a lot of archival research, which is sometimes fascinating and sometimes very frustrating. And then uh, a lot of very pleasurable time in a lot of different museums. Um, I think writing it, if it, during, if it had been under COVID, it would have been impossible. I and mean, I have a new project I'm working on now that's pretty much stalled because you know, for understandable reasons, uh, archives aren't open. And um, the research, uh, you know, the research and the writing are sometimes thrilling and sometimes extremely galling. When I was a graduate student, one of my teachers, um, Peter Gay, uh, called me in for a chat, which I knew was not going to be good news. And um, it wasn't, though I don't think it was ill-intended on his part. And he was trying to impress on me the importance of doing a lot of the basic grunt work that was not going to be fun. And I remember him saying to me, you know, history isn't always a champagne dinner, though my girlfriend at the time said it was for him. Uh, though I think that was a little unfair. And um, there's a lot of page turning, there's a lot of dead ends, and there's a lot of surprises. So it's just something you persevere with. You know, I've always considered myself lucky to have the opportunity to do something that I care about and that I think is valuable. And um, I've never really sat in an archive taking my emotional temperature, but I am the kind of person who wants to get up, walk around, see the city, and um, not just sit there hour after hour. That I think is just beyond me. <laughs> With so much prized art either stolen or trading hands under questionable circumstances for not just decades, but centuries, did you feel like a detective at times? Or did anyone wonder why you're asking questions about how some of these masterpieces were acquired? 
Well, I think that the historian is on one level always a detective. You're always investigating. You're always asking questions. Um, Tolstoy um, once quipped that historians answer questions no one asks, which he didn't mean as a compliment. Um, but sometimes asking the questions no one asks is just what you have to do because that's what's been ignored. And that's what I've tried to do in this book. You know, by the time I started writing it, there was pretty good public awareness of the immensity of uh, the Nazi plunder of Jewish-owned art collections. But what frustrated me and what interested me was, well, how did these people um, who were outsiders um, acquire so much old and great um, art in the first place? How did they come to play a pivotal role in the art world? And that was um, detective work. And certainly um, there's detective work in terms of you're trying to track down um, where materials are or what happened to a particular um, work of art. Uh, and you know, one of the frustrations about uh, being a historian is, you know, however hard you work, there are always things you can't find out. Uh, there's always a gap. Uh, there's always that vital piece of information which you can knock your head against the wall for a long time and not find. And then you have to just play with it as honestly as you can. So part of it is the detective work, which can be arduous, though when you hit gold, it's, you know, fun. Uh, and then there's the question of the writing and the rewriting and the rewriting and trying to tell a vivid and rich compelling story. Um, and that is a lot of fun when it goes well. The story you tell is bigger than the Jewish art dealers who are featured in the book because they weren't operating in a vacuum. As you write, there was a massive sell-off of aristocratic family art collections, the gradual opening of European high culture, the emergence of different schools of modern art, and the cultural impact of World War I that shaped the modern art world. Would you take on each of those topics and their place in the context of the seismic change? Sure. So in the, um, the late 19th, early 20th century, there was a vast, unprecedented sell-off of um, fine and decorative art that had been owned by European landed aristocracies. And the, um, the, the story that I know best is what happened in Britain. Um, British aristocrats had been great patrons of the art, great collectors of the arts in the 18th century when they went on their grand tours, often with their tutors for a year or two on the continent um, of sketching buildings, buying art, probably a certain amount of carousing that they didn't write about. Um, they collected old masters, including um, great Italian old masters, Titians, Raphaels, Tintorettos, that uh, Venetian and Florentine noblemen um, had, um, had to sell because they were down on their luck and they needed capital. Uh, and this is a situation of what goes round comes round in the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, many of the uh, British aristocrats found themselves in dire financial straits. Now, not the ones that most of us can find ourselves in. These are people who had uh, major estates in many cases and vast holdings, but their wealth was in land. Uh, and when the ag an agricultural depression took place, and when death duties just rocketed up, they needed a way to settle those death duties when an estate passed from a father to the eldest son to the heir. So among the things they sold off were family art collections, both these old masters they had paintings that they had collected on their grand tours, um, but also paintings that their ancestors had commissioned um, from great painters like Reynolds or Gainsborough or some of the other English painters like Lawrence or Romney. And uh, these paintings go on the block in auction houses or through dealers. And um, they end up going to uh, American collectors 
uh, many of whom come from the new rich, a capitalist elite, uh, which is seeking um, trophies to underline their status. But on a more idealistic level, they also want beautiful things in their lives. And this vast sell-off of art, uh, which is something that you can see if you watch Downton Abbey of how an aristocratic family, a rather fanciful one, but you know, there are some general outlines that are true, tries to deal with um, a financial shortfall. Uh, the gradual opening of European high culture. Um, in the course of the 18th century, um, high culture moves from the royal court um, to the city, to the metropolis. Um, in um, 1660, uh, there were no museums, no galleries, no concert halls in London um, or Paris or other European capitals. But what happens in the course of the 18th century, and this proceeds more rapidly in the 19th century, is that what had been a royal preserve, what had been an aristocratic preserve, uh, uh, what had been a preserve of the great prelates um, of the church um, is moving into the city and it is accessible to the public. And the public is a, va a vast phrase, but this is a, a wonderful process of democratization. In terms of the emergence of modern art, um, the people that I write about uh, were involved with almost every successive school of modern art, um, impressionists, post-impressionists, the Fauves, the, the Cubists, the Surrealists, the Futurists, um, you name it. Um, but it really begins in Paris in the 1860s and 1870s when Edouard Manet and his followers the Impressionists pioneer this painting of modern life, uh, which is modern in two ways. Modern in the sense that uh, they are turning away from classical themes and motifs and looking at the great monuments of the modern age, uh, whether it's the railway station, the cafe, um, the department store, but it's also modern in the sense that um, they are painting in open air. Um, they are not um, squarely concerned with following uh, the rules of artistic convention. Uh, they, are they are conveying an impression. Uh, World War I, well, what we call modernism, this explosion of art and thought, um, which takes the form of a variety of different things that we're familiar with, whether it's functionalist architecture or atonal music or expressionist painting or depth psychology, all of these things surface in the years before the First World War. But the, the war is a watershed. It is, um, as the great Protestant theologian Paul Tillich said, um, the Victorian age ended in August 1914 with the beginning of World War I and with this massive slaughter discrediting a lot of the ideals that were put forth by the leaders of church and state, uh, encouraging young men to go to war for God and country and this terrible loss of life, as well as the countless people um, who were traumatized by the war or who lost limbs. And there was in the wake of the war, uh, a greater receptivity to new forms of aesthetic expression, which didn't show just a rational, ordered, logical universe because that wasn't the universe that these young soldiers experienced. The group that you write about of Jewish art collectors and dealers, how large was it? Well, you know, it's hard to say. Um, art dealing and collecting are always going to be minority interests. Um, you have to attain a certain level of prosperity to collect art. Um, Though it depends what you're collecting. Um, if you were in Paris in 1901 and you had 100 francs, 
Um, you could pick up a Picasso drawing that would cost millions and millions today, even if you could get it. Uh, on the other hand, if you wanted to buy a Rembrandt, you were competing with the likes of H.C. Frick and J.P. Morgan and Benjamin Altman, so the great um, people of great wealth. Um, what's, I think, important more than the numbers is how these people come to prominence. But I will give you one number, which is an estimate. Pierre Loeb, um, who was a um, distinguished dealer in Paris of avant-garde art on the left bank and represented most of the surrealists, estimated that four out of five dealers in avant-garde art in Paris in the 1920s and 30s were Jews. Your book reveals how certain Jewish outsiders came to acquire so many old and modern masterpieces in the first place. And what this reveals about Jews, art, and modernity. What does this saga reveal about Jews, art, and modernity? Well, I think it reveals a lot of the complexities of all of the above. Um, the assumption that people used to make was that what happened to Jews in the modern age was something that we call assimilation. And assimilation is one of those really misleading words because really what, it, what, it, what would make it meaningful if you say, well, assimilating what? Um, assimilating a particular uh, notion of democracy, assimilating a particular style of art, assimilating a language. Um, and I think what I what you what you see in my book is this the struggle to belong, the struggle to succeed, to mediate between different worlds. What's interesting um, about most of the people that I write about is, by and large, these are secular Jews. They are people who are bent on cultural integration but they also have very significant Jewish ties. And very often this had little to do with religion, uh, but it had a lot to do with um, uh, where they lived, who they knew, who they associated with, what occupations they followed. Because one of the interesting things about minorities, and Jews are a good example of this, is minorities don't tend to be evenly distributed in every occupation, partly because minorities are almost always fighting discrimination, or as we know, as we know now and see um, every day in our own society, um, structural racism and discrimination, which is so ingrained that it's it's too easy for us not to see it. So what tends to happen is that when minorities um, find an endeavor in which they are, which is relatively open, they go for it. And once certain people succeed in it, there's a demonstration effect. You can do it too. Uh, maybe there are people who will help you along the way. And you see this in the case of modern art. Um, Jews play a critical role in championing modern art as collectors, as dealers, as critics, um, uh, ultimately as historians of modern art. And there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one reason was um, the migration of Jews from Eastern Europe and Russia um, to the Western Europe, to Central Europe, um, their urbanization, their move to cities, especially to capital cities. If you had the same people that I write about uh, were living in small villages and towns and spent their lives there, they never would have been involved in art. Not because of lack of ability, but they wouldn't have had the opportunity and they wouldn't have had the orientation. Uh, there wouldn't have been museums to see, there wouldn't have been galleries. So part of this is larger seismic social processes but also look at modern art in another way. Modern art, like a lot of the um, endeavors that Jews became involved in, and in certain cases excelled in, 
was new, it was rapidly expanding. What that meant was that barriers to entry were lower. Um, uh, professional hierarchies had not gelled yet. Um, so they were less likely to face discrimination. Uh, and especially in um, branches of art um, that were not considered particularly valuable, uh, let alone lucrative, there just wasn't much competition uh, because those who were better established already had a foothold. And these people did not have a foothold in this world. They were almost all self-taught, self-made men and women. Um, and that's what's in a sense so extraordinary about the story is how without much formal education, um, they trained their eyes by scouring museums and galleries by looking at picture after picture, sculpture after sculpture. And um, they go into fields in which being entrepreneurial um, is an advantage. And that's a big part of this story. You write, the story of Nazi stolen art may not be a story without an end, but its end is not yet in sight. What do you see as you look ahead when it comes to restitution? It's amazing to me that 20 years after this resurgence of interest in Nazi stolen art um, began, and in which claim after claim has been filed, that the story is still going on. Um, I can't tell you the reasons for, for this exactly, um, because I don't quite understand it, to be honest. I don't think anybody does, but I'll give you a couple. Um, one of which is it's a lot easier now to find out what happened to most, but not all works of art that were plundered during the Nazi era, some from 1933 to 1945. We just have better sources of information, um, provenance research being done at museums, galleries, auction houses, um, indices being compiled. Um, but still, um, there are a lot of people who cannot find much less um, recapture the art. I think there are claims that are outstanding um, and there are still deep problems. I'll give you an example. Um, this fall, an exhibit opened in Dusseldorf at the City Museum um, about the life and work of a German Jewish dealer and collector named Max Stern. Um, who went into the family gallery after earning a doctorate um, in art history. And he goes into the family business at the worst possible time. He's dreaming of opening galleries in London and New York. And what he's faced with almost immediately is Nazi persecution, the need to liquidate um, the art collection, and ultimately um, the need to get the family out of Germany. And um, he ends up in Montreal, uh, where um, he becomes a very successful gallerist. And you would think, well, this is an interesting subject for an exhibit. And yes, it is. Um, but the story behind it is not so salubrious because the story behind it is a couple of years before another exhibit was going to go up in the same museum in the same city about Max Stern. And then the mayor of Dusseldorf and his counselors um, canceled it because the, um, they were afraid that the exhibit would create more interest in contested works of art that were still in German museums, including the museum in Dusseldorf. So on the one hand, there are the people who are more than willing to remember um, the lives and works of these Jews. And then there are people who are willing, however reluctantly um, or generously in other cases, to restitute art to their rightful heirs. Um, 
but there's a tension between these things. So my guess is that what's going to happen is we're still going to have claims, but I think the claims are gonna trail off and they're trail off partly because um, by now, uh, the people who are filing the claims are far removed from the scene of the crime. Uh, they're far removed from uh, the family, the history and the culture, which doesn't necessarily make them less meaningful or make their claims less just. But I think um, it will eventually begin to trail off. But don't take it from me um, because I was wrong about the um, the amount of time this has gone on. So Professor, anything I'm, goes. I'm sorry, we're out of time, sir. I apologize. Charles Delheim, thanks so much for your time. So we truly appreciate it. It's been a fascinating story. Thank you so much, Chris. And thanks to our listeners. We'll see you next week, same time. Until then, keep taking your next steps forward.